Kama is very analogous to this type, this type of, of law. It works first and primarily at the, at the mental level, but then it plays out in the physical world. That uh, aspect is sometimes difficult uh, for people to see or grasp, but uh, it, it, it uh, rests on the way we look at the concepts of, of mind and, and materiality. The Buddha said that mind is the chief, mind is the forerunner, mind um, our body follows the mind like the cart follows the ox. The world that we actually live in and experience, if we understand it properly, is actually a uh, product of our mind. It's a simulation that we create in our mind from incoming sense data. We have uh, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, uh, and we get signals from the uh, external world. Limited amount of information, light at a certain frequency, sound at, at a certain frequency, certain chemicals in the air that are trace chemicals that we perceive with the nose and smells. And uh, the mind takes these signals and through the faculty of perception, or sanya, uh, it, it recognizes and it essentially creates uh, a, a world to live in from the incoming sense data, which is not to deny the reality of the outside world, but just to be clear, we never actually experience the outside world directly. We experience only, mediated by the senses, we experience we experience only our perception of the world. So, in this way, mind is primary. Mind is what uh, we, the only thing that we actually directly experience. And the activities of mind are various and manifold, and they can be analyzed in different ways, but the aspect that's relevant to our topic this evening is that some part of the sequence of mind uh, mental operation is classed as comic effective, meaning that there's volition involved, we have choice, we have free will, and we then act through mind, speech, and body. And this, these actions, um, you could say the and anything that we do with mind, speech, or body disturbs the universe slightly. It, it moves things off that zero point. So then the other aspect of mind is kama resultant or upaka. And uh, the, the results of kama are experienced by beings like us as sense objects. So every, according to the Abhidhamma, every sense experience that we have is classed as a kama resultant. And the sense impressions that are presented to us have, as one of their causes, they have kama that we have previously made, either in this lifetime or in some previous lifetime. So, if we understand this properly, this understanding of the way our experience in the world works is not deterministic because we have, at each moment, we have the freedom to move in a new direction. But it's also not arbitrary or random, not without cause. The things that we experience are a result uh, in part of our previous kama. Now, careful, careful to say in part, because no, it's another 
law or principle that everything arises according to the causes, but also a second uh, corollary to that is that nothing arises from a single cause. There are multiple causes for each event. So, for example, if we um, have a pleasant sense experience, take, say, uh, seeing a beautiful sunset. We see a beautiful sunset. Um, one of the causes for that event is that it, we have made some previous good karma uh, that results in pleasant sense experience. But that by itself is not sufficient. There's also uh, other causes of the beautiful sunset that are completely outside of our uh, human agency. There's atmospheric conditions, there's the rotation of the earth, there's the angle of the sun, and so on. But the fact that we were in that time and place and happened to look up and see the beautiful sunset, there is a, a, a comic component to that. So our experience is to a, a large degree determined by our kama. So it, it's another way to think of it, a good analogy is uh, playing a game of cards, you're playing bridge or poker or whatever your game of cards, you're dealt a hand, that's your past karma. That's already given you, you have that. So at that moment when you, at this moment, your past karma for each one of us is fixed, it's determined, there's nothing we can do about it, it's there, that's the hand you've got to play with. But then, the next, in the next moment, you have to choose which card you're going to play. And that's your immediate uh, present comma making new comma. So we have this uh, degree of freedom in each moment, uh, somewhat circumscribed by the conditions we set up for ourselves in the past. Even the, uh, the fact that uh, we have been born as human beings is a result of uh, good karma made in the past. It's a very rare, in, in the totality of the universe, it's a very rare, uh, fortunate birth to be born as a human being. The great multitude of uh, beings in the lower realms dwarfs the number of human beings. Just consider the amount of insects and bugs and small creatures in the ocean and so forth. And there are many, many thousands or millions of times more than the number of human beings. <clears throat> so the fact that we have come into existence as a human being is already the result of having made sufficiently good karma in the past. Then it becomes even more rare if we're born as a human being in a time and place when the Buddha's teachings are still extant and we can hear the Buddha's teaching. And it's even more rare if we have the ability uh, to uh, hear the teachings and take them in and the leisure to practice them. Well, the fortune and good circumstances to be exposed to the Dhamma and have the opportunity to, to practice. That's all a result of previous karma that we've been made. The, the actual unfolding of karma is very complex and subtle, and, and we can never understand or unravel it completely. The Buddha said this is one of the things that is impossible to fully comprehend all the detailed workings of karma. But we do have some kind of general principles. Uh, um, kama uh, is said um, to be of four kinds in terms of the, the quality. There's a bright kama leading to bright results, dark kama leading to dark results, mixed karma leading to both bright and dark results, and the kama that leads outside or beyond karma. Um, well, bright karma is actions that we perform in the world 
that are in accord with the five precepts and in a more kind of general principle is actions that reduce suffering for self and others. So acts of generosity and kindness uh, are, are good karma. Uh, bad karma or dark karma leading to dark results are actions that increase the suffering in, in the world. So actions that break the precepts or that cause suffering in any way, uh, cruelty or harming uh, other beings is, is uh, negative or, or dark karma leading to dark results. The karma leading outside of karma is when we practice for liberation, which is always the, the highest goal of Buddhist practice, is to uh, attain to the unconditioned, which is beyond karma, has nothing to do with karma. The realization of Nibbana. So, uh, karma is a law that governs the operation of samsara, of this conditioned world. And as long as we're in that conditioned state, we should understand that law and use it wisely and try to maximize our good results by making good actions now. But we should always keep our eye on the main prize and work for liberation, which is uh, practicing uh, the Eightfold Path, keeping good sila, and meditating, particularly Vipassana meditation, to realize the nature of body and mind and free oneself from desire and from ignorance and aversion and realize, realize the condition. That's the Kama leading beyond Kama. Now, the, the category in the middle, mixed, mixed Kama with mixed results, is probably a... a, a a, a majority of the cases of the actions that we do. Everything in the world is muddled. You know? um, and uh, sometimes when, in the past, when I've given uh, talks on this uh, topic, then sometimes the questions people ask are, some of the questions end up being kind of sort of scenarios. What if I did this or that in such and such a situation? Is that good or bad karma? And very often it's mixed karma. Uh, what we do uh, um, in the world sometimes has both good and bad results. Um, an example I've heard sometimes is given, you know, taken from an Asian context. I was, I was trained in Thailand. Uh, if um, you've got a, uh, a, a swamp with malaria mosquitoes in the swamp, and they're biting people and people are getting malaria and the uh, health workers from the government come and spray insecticide in the swamp to kill the mosquitoes. And you know, this is, on the one hand, it's a bad karma of killing. They kill many hundreds of mosquitoes. But on the other hand, it's good karma of improving the health of the village. So that it's a mixed, uh, a mixed karma. It's not a clean cut case, and many of the things we do in the world are, are like that. Uh, it is incumbent on us in such circumstances to try, first of all, to maximize the, the bright aspect, and particularly to um, pay attention to our mind and our motiv motivation. Uh, if the health worker goes in to spray the swamp and he's thinking the whole time, I hate these damn mosquitoes. I want to, I'll be happy to kill every damn one of these little buggers. <laughs> <laughs> then, you know, this is a, a different mindset than if he thinks about the, uh, all the poor children in the village are getting sick with malaria and we really need to do something about that. You know, then, you know, that's a completely different mindset. It's still mixed karma, but in one side he's maximizing the dark impulse and the other side the bright impulse. This brings up another kind of um, consideration about uh, karma and ethics. Uh, and the, whole, the whole topic of, of ethical 
decisions is, is a broad one. And I, uh, I've thought that this is a, an interesting distinction between Theravada and Mahayana in their understanding of how ethics works. Um, as far as uh, uh, we're concerned in the, in the Theravada, I would argue that the ultimate reason for ethics is, is the training of the mind. That, and uh, when we take the precept not to kill, so we don't kill, we try not to kill a mosquito. The mosquito is biting us, we try not to kill it, we try and just flick it off or let it bite. That's not, ultimately from our understanding, that's not for the sake of the mosquito. It's for our own sake that we don't arouse in our mind the impulse to kill or harm. Then we're purifying our own mind. And the same with all the other precepts, not stealing, not committing adultery, not taking intoxicants, uh, not, uh, uh, not telling lies. These are all uh, corrupt into our mind if we break them. Now, the, from the Mahayana point of view, they criticize the Theravada as being kind of narrow and legalistic in their understanding. And they allow a trump card in the ethical um, equation and considerations of compassion. If you, uh, Mahayana uh, would say that if you're acting from compassion, you can break the precepts. Um, I, uh, give an example there's a story uh, a Jataka story which, these are the stories of the Buddha's previous lives and this story occurs only in the Mahayana collection it doesn't, it's not a Theravada story so it illustrates their understanding of the ethical principle there's a ship at sea with 500 merchants on the, on the ship one of them is the Bodhisattva, and, and another one is actually a, um, a pirate or a criminal in disguise. And he has the plan in, in, at night, he's got a plan to kill everybody and take over the ship and take, steal everybody's goods and make himself rich. And the Bodhisattva, with his psychic power, he, um, he reads that guy's mind and he knows the plan. So he kills the, the, the pirate with a sword and then he's seized by the ship's company as a murderer and thrown overboard. So he's killed the, the pirate and sacrificed his own life but saved the rest of the ship. Uh, and he did, he said to have you know, done that action out of compassion for the other people on the ship. Now that would not be justified in the Theravada understanding of ethics. It's still an act of killing. And it's still, uh, he would still be taking on the bad karma of killing, and that doesn't, so that story doesn't appear in our collection. Um, I think that the Theravada understand, whatever you may say in favor of the Mahayana version, I think the Theravada version is safer. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't allow. Uh, if you allow this uh, universal trump card of compassion, you can justify just about anything. So if you understand things on a more um, uh, a more formal basis of keeping the precepts, then your actions will will always be within the bounds of of, of uh, minimizing harm. There's another Mahayana story it's from Tibet that perhaps uh, illustrates this point even more strongly. Is Padmasambhava in the marketplace? Now, Padmasambhava is a great Tibetan teacher, and there's one story about him that he was in the marketplace and he uh, he saw uh, a shop girl squatting as they do in, you know, in the outdoor markets in Asia. She's squatting by her goods, 
and a fly lands on her forehead and she's about to slap the fly. He picks up a cobblestone and throws it with great force so that it kills the fly and the girl together simultaneously. And uh, he's seized by the king's men and they put him on a big pyre of wood and light him on fire as a, as a criminal. And when the fire burns out, he's sitting in lotus posture, unharmed. And so they're all amazed. And he, he then explains to them that with his uh, powers, he saw the past lives of this fly and the girl. And there's a whole long train of exchanges that in one life, one of them was a deer and the other was a hunter. And then in the next life, they switch. And one of them's a poisonous snake and the other one's something else. And they kill each other. Ultimately, lifetime by lifetime, and he and the girl was about to carry on this this chain of events by killing the fly, uh, and he broke the chain by killing them both together simultaneously. So this is a, you know, this is a kind of kind of an amazing story. We're not, you know, not we're, we're none of us have this kind of a. Uh, Transcendental wisdom of uh, Pamus and Bawa. But if we, uh, I think it's very dangerous if we allow ourselves to think, well, the compassionate thing here would be to kill the fly and the girl. <laughs> you know, this could really cause trouble in the world if we allow ourselves to think in that way. So I prefer to stay with the tried and true, kind of boring old Theravada <laughs> of, of sticking to the precepts. <laughs> and this uh, um, this is the re the really way to uh, for us to work with karma going forward, and that's what's important. Now, and this is an, another thing to bear in mind when we're thinking about karma and results. We should put our emphasis and our focus in the fresh karma we're making now. The karma that we've got from the past. We can't do anything about it. It's already done and gone. Right? And we're experiencing the results of it. But uh, what comes in the future is entirely uh, within our freedom to, to change and effect. And it takes some effort. It's not easy. There's another aspect of karma is habituated or habitual karma. That if we... Uh, repeat the same sort of actions over and over, they become habitual, they become habits. And we dig ruts in the mind. And if we don't make an effort, we just keep following along that same path. Um, Ajahn Chah gave a, like a parable explaining this. He said that, um, talking about the ox carts that they used to travel in uh, rural Thailand in the old days. These, um, carts pulled by a water buffalo and they would have uh, uh, big, very big wheels with a narrow, a narrow base, a, a narrow rim. And if you're riding a cart back and forth between two villages and it's a well-traveled route people use a lot, the carts will dig ruts into the rope. And you can go to sleep in the cart. And the water buffalo will just follow the path of least resistance, he'll go around corners and whatever and take you to the, your destination. But if you want to go to this other village over here that's, that people don't visit so often, then you've got to stop the cart when you get to the turning point. You've got to get out, unhook the water buffalo, drag the cart out of the, the ruts, turn it around, and chase the water buffalo back and wander it off. <laughs> hook him up to the cart, and then you have to stay awake and guide him all the way because there's no, no ruts to take, it, take charge. And he said, this is like the mind. Now, if we engrave a habit in the mind, then we can just keep following it. And we exercise, in such a case, we exercise very little volition. There's no willpower. It's just carrying on the path of least resistance. But if we want to break out of that, it takes effort. And we could use that principle to our advantage 
You, know, you can dig new ruts. You can make good habits in the mind. And this is, uh, for example, doing a, a daily meditation practice. You know, people sometimes ask about advice about doing a meditation practice, and I think the most important thing is that is consistency. That you set a certain time of day. This is my time for meditation, no matter what. This is, and whether I want to do it or not, whether I feel inspired or not, I'm going to practice meditation for this period of time every day. And after some time, that becomes a really uh, firm habit, and there's no longer any sense of effort or forcing yourself to do it. You just do it. That, that's the same with any kind of uh, uh, skillful habit that we want to pick up. It works the same way as an unskillful habit. We, we set a pattern in the mind and it becomes easy and automatic and just part of our ordinary uh, routine. That's using habitual karma to, uh, to advantage. So um, I'll come. I'll bring it to a conclusion and go to questions and answers. Just to sum up, we're talking about kama as action that we do in the world with body, speech, and mind, volitional action that has an effect that is felt. It's always then felt at a later moment, either in this life or in a subsequent life. And the karma can be either good, bad, mixed, or uh, transcendental. So uh, I'll stop there and take uh, questions, have a discussion. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that's a good point because the situations we find ourselves in are are the results of our past karma. So, um, if we if we find our life tangled and full of these complications, then you should ask yourself, what what have I done to set this situation up? And, and then try and go going forward to. Uh, uh, rectify that in the future by being more clear, you know, with, with your actions. Uh, very often, the uh, the cause of these kind of naughty complications in the life is, is some degree of uh, underlying shakiness in the um, uh, fourth precept, the precept about uh, honesty. If there's some sort of uh, deceit or trickery or just kind of shading the truth and we're setting up complications that, you know, that could be avoided by a more straightforward approach. Yeah, so if you really commit to that precept, because you, you both Shakespeare, uh, like, oh, what would be? Yes, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah, if you tell the truth all the time, you don't have to keep track of your lies. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking, yes. about the actual act of verbalizing our thoughts yeah. and its relationship to karma, yeah. and uh, 
like like the relationship between spoken word karma and and volition, um, and how much. I mean, does it make sense to to, to attempt vigilantly on a daily basis to really um, monitor our speaking? And when is it appropriate to speak truth? And when is it maybe appropriate to withhold truth? If yes. It's hurt? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Yeah, we should be watching what we say. We should be careful with speech. There's a there's a teaching that, uh, that um, I really like for summing up right speech. Is the Buddha once spoke about the type of speech that a tathagata, meaning an enlightened person, would utter and not utter. And uh, we laid down four principles. The first one is that anything that the Tagata would say is in accordance with truth and not otherwise. So it would always be true. Second, it would always uh, be meaningful. The word in Pali is atta, which is a, a concept that means like important, um, uh, with meaning, with purpose. It's purposeful. So not just kind of chitter chatter, but meaning to it. So speech is meaningful and not otherwise. And the third principle is it's beneficial to the listener and not otherwise. So it's something that would do them and be useful for them to hear. And the, the fourth one is the important one for your question. And it's interesting the way it's phrased is that he is broken into two uh, sides. It says, the speech is always pleasant to hear or spoken at the right time. So you can imagine there's a situation where uh, you, have, you need to criticize somebody. So what you speak is true, it's beneficial for them to hear this, and it's meaningful, but it's not going to be pleasant to hear. So then you have to decide the, when's the right time. And there's a, um, a guide to that in one of the uh, uh, passages in the Vinaya that applies to when one monk should admonish another on his behavior. And I think it applies, it could apply generally to anyone. It says, first, you have to examine your own mind. First of all, are you free of that fault? If you're not free of that fault yourself, you should shut up. <laughs> and the second is um, are you free of anger if, if, you're, if, you're st if you're feeling angry towards the person you should wait until you calm down and the third point is you have to, it is tricky you have to decide to your best judgment is the other person in a mood to hear the, what you have to say or is it just going to make them defensive and argumentative and if that's the case, you should wait again. So if you run through that whole whole list, a lot of times you should just keep your peace. But uh, if you can benefit somebody with a, a proper criticism at the right time, then it, it's, it's meritorious to do so. Yes, that's true. And that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Yeah. You don't need to clear the air in certain situations. No, no, you just keep your peace. Okay. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had a question about mental karma. Uh huh. In that, like, if I'm thinking negative thoughts about someone, yes. right? Yeah. I know that it's bad to say something. Yeah. yeah, like say something mean. Yes. It's definitely bad to harm them yes. physically. Yes. But if I'm thinking negative thoughts about someone, and you know maybe my practice isn't very strong or, or something, and those yeah. thoughts are proliferating, <laughs> yeah, which yeah, they tend yeah. to do. Yeah. Um, how is that like? What's the karmic? There that. is there is karma associated with thought, but it's much lighter than than if if it ex, then it's expressed bodily. You know, but you are you are 
um, making uh, a negative karma in the mind, which will, you know, if you indulge in those kinds of, you can see a result of it, is if you indulge in those kinds of thought over, over time without any attempt to check them, then it's going to make you into a, a negative, grouchy person, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, uh, the, so the, the, we do habituate our mind um, in one direction or another with our thoughts. If you have a random thought of ill will about somebody, you don't feed it or go with it. It's only very slight. But if you then keep in, indulging in it again and again, you can really set a pattern in the mind, and it's going to become a problem. So yeah, so that was kind of interesting to me because it sort of plays on that. Like I guess it's it's considered a habit then, because to some extent, yeah, you can especially if you have a good practice, you can kind of stop the proliferation. Yeah. But sometimes that initial thought, yeah. I don't, I'm not anywhere near the point where I can yeah. stop that. Yeah. So um, would that fall under habitual? No, or? no. The initial thought is not habitual. <clears throat> not. Okay. It's just a, a random thought. Okay. And there's, there's, there is some comment associated to it, but it's very slight. Okay. There's a question from online audience. Um, someone asks, what intention for your action is so important to think about? Uh, say, say again, I, I, um, I didn't understand the question. What intention for your action is so important to think about? I guess they mean what oh, kinds well, of intentions. Thinking about the intention of your action? Yeah. Um, um, just six, yeah. yeah, the intention of your action is quite important. Uh, that's. That's maybe something I didn't. I should have mentioned in the in my talk is that actions with intention in Buddhist theory is what makes kama. Uh, uh, an action without intention makes no kama, and this is different from the understanding of the Jains, for example, who say kama is made with the body. So the practical, the example that's given in the text is if you step on a beetle in the dark. There's no kama made. The, you know, if you stomp on a be beetle deliberately in the daylight, you you want to kill the beetle. You stomp on it. You know that's kama. You're making a bad kama. But if you step on it in the dark, then you're not making any kama. You, the result for the beetle is the same in either case. <laughs> so this is also where the like the subjective aspect of, of the ethics is important. So you can do that harm in the world, killing a beetle in the, in the night without knowing it, and there's no karma involved. It's just a, a, a non a, a non effective event. It's just some like an accident or um, you know or like a natural event. It's not something you've done with deliberation. So the intention is what actually makes the karma. There's one sort of, so somebody came up with a real kind of funny one as an uh, example, is uh, a man puts a knife into another man's belly. And that can be either good, bad, or indifferent. So if it's a surgeon trying to save his life, it's, it's good karma. If it's a robber trying to steal his money, that's bad karma. And if a man's just standing at the corner peeling a piece of fruit and the other one runs around the corner and impales himself, <laughs> there's no comma either way. <laughs> I believe you mentioned transcendental karma or transcendental yeah. karma, yeah. whatever. That's uh, transcendental I'm using to translate uh, lokutara or beyond the world. Super mundane as that which is beyond this conditioned world, which is the unconditioned or nibbana. So it's liberation from samsara. So uh, everything in this conditioned world is governed by cause. That's called conditioned because it's governed by causes and conditions. It's, uh, it's pali sankata, and it's it's uh, subject to change and falling away and suffering. And that's what we're caught in and what we're trying to get out of. And the liberation from that is the unconditioned, asankata or nirvana, which is beyond cause and effect, beyond kama, has nothing to do with, with any of that, 
as like total liberation. So any actions that we do leading towards that goal are, are karma which leads out of karma. You said that the, um, the key part is intention. So yes. what intentions lead out? The, the, uh, the intention to, uh, first of all, understand uh, this reality and then to uh, abandon abandon attachment or craving for these experiences and then uh, releasing or um, uh, allowing them to come to cessation, breaking free of them. Right? And those are all like intentional acts that we perform along the way. You know, we, we do that by practicing um, the pasana, which is clear seeing, the meditation of, of just observing phenomena without attachment. So that takes an intention to practice to do that. You have to make an intention, I'm going to do this practice. And that leads us out of samsara. is in, in Pali's Karuna. The word compassion, as an English translation, is a little bit misleading. It's subtly misleading because it comes from Latin and it means to feel with. And uh, Karuna is not that. It's not, um, it's not picking up vicarious suffering. Like if you see some being in suffering, you see it, you know, um, uh, a dog that's been hit by a car has got a broken leg and you feel that makes you feel sad that's not karuna in the Buddhist sense uh, karuna is should is uh, sh it should not make you feel sad that's pity that's what you know it's model and it's like sentimental but karuna is a uh, arouses an earnest wish to release suffering to relieve suffering so then that has to be uh, that by itself is an emotional state, right? And that can motivate actions in the world, but then they can only be effective if they're also governed by wisdom. But you have to decide, you see being suffering in one way or another, then you have to use wisdom to decide, is there anything effective that I can do? If there's nothing effective you can do, then you don't do anything. And, you know, this is sometimes hard for people. Be, you feel, you see suffering and you have a good heart and you feel compassionate and you want to help. And there's nothing really you can do, but you blunder in and make things worse. Right? But, but if you have wisdom, you look and see, well, I can do something. I can help this situation. I can help, you know, maybe I can take the dog to the vet. Or maybe, there's, maybe there's something you can do. But if there's nothing you can do, you just have to let it be. But you still feel compassion. You still feel an earnest wish that the suffering will relieve. Um, if you've been violated or sexually molested or raped, what, um, is that really due to past karma? Uh, yes. That will, anything that impacts our life that there was some past karma that set that up. So this 
Wouldn't that be more on the karma of the person who... Well, they're made, the person who perpetuates the deed is then making very bad karma for themselves. I find that interpretation I mean, problematic in that if you're an innocent bystander, it's already predetermined that you have this karma? Uh, well, anything you experience as one component is going to be a result of your past karma. So if you experience some evil deed done by another person, then uh, there's something that you have done in a previous lifetime that set that comic circumstance. But then that, that other person is now making evil comma for themselves. That they're going to experience some uh, negative result of that in the future as well. So we should focus, like I said, focus on going forward. Like to determine not to do harmful deeds. So you're not making comic seeds that you're going to suffer in the future. If a police officer kills someone to protect, is it a bad karma? Um, I, yeah, this is one of these cases where you're looking really at mixed karma. You know, if you're um, if you're trying to protect yourself or someone else and you use violence to do it, there's still a negative comment involved of harming somebody, but there's also a motivation of helping. So it ends up, it ends up being one of those gray areas of mixed kind of. Who's keeping the ledger? Nobody. That's the yeah. That's that's the that's the the thing of the uh, the Buddhist understanding of karma is natural law. It's not. There's nobody. It's not like a judgmental god who's meeting out rewards and punishments. And that's that's a, important to understand because in in, in one sense then um, it, it it's harsher even <laughs> because it's more it's more uh, auto, automatic. There's no, you can't plead mercy. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just what you've done, your deeds are going to have results. And it's just a natural law. Yes? So that makes me think of the concept of grace, and there is a concept of grace in Mahayana, isn't there? That you can be relieved of the consequences of your karma by beings, one sort or another. Uh, yeah, particularly in Vajrayana, they do have some some ceremonies and ideas like that, like Kawa. But, uh, but there's none whatsoever in Theravada. No, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. Theravada is quite rigorous about, um, you know, you are responsible for your own mind states, you are responsible for your own actions, and you're the only one who can liberate yourself. So that... Uh, you know, I can see why people, how, why these other teachings come in because people want there to be some kind of loopholes and escape classes. <laughs> you know, they want some kind of easy ticket out. But you know, the, um, our teaching is that the reality, reality is, it's all, it's all on you. You have to make your own. You, you make your own karma. You have to make your own liberation. Which is not to say help isn't available. No, yeah, yeah, uh, um, yeah. Uh, there, there's all you can get all kinds of, of help in terms of you know, advice and teachings and pointers, you know. But uh, you have to end up, you know, doing the work yourself. comment something on Sila in terms of like maybe backsliding. Let's just say someone's gone like uh, three years with solid practice. Sila yeah. like intact and then yeah. they get drunk. Yeah. Does yeah. that throw yeah. away those three years? No, no, no. No. What then what then uh, that person should do is to uh, retake the precepts. 
and make it, uh, uh, don't make any um, excuse for themselves. Just admit, okay, I've done this bad thing. And, and, you, and you don't even have to admit it to anyone else, just to yourself. You know, I, I've done this, I've broken the precept. Now I'm going to retake my, my precept and commit myself to, to keeping it in the future. One thing you can also uh, consider is when something bad happens, that uh, in, a, in a way, how, no matter how bad it is, there's, there's a, a, a silver lining that, well, this old calm has already has been extinguished now. Mm -hmm. a, I remember hearing about a um, story about a monastery where the, one of the novices fell off a ladder and broke his leg. And they, they went and told the abbot, they were all upset and told them, uh, Oh, you know, novice so and so has fallen and broke his leg. And the abbot laughed and clapped in his hands and said, "Good, good, good for him. He's he's finally got rid of that old karma." <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately understood, there's no accidents, there's no coincidences, there's no random chance. Everything is, everything is uh, according to causes and conditions. So it's uh, getting to be close to 8.30. We'll wrap it up pretty pretty soon. Is there any any last questions? Is there a possibility in Theravada that doing good karma reduces the effects of previous bad karma to some extent, some slight? Yeah, um, it's not so much that it reduces it, but it pushes it to the back of the queue. <laughs> <laughs> the, the idea is if you've got some, some bad karma and you overwhelm it by with good deeds, it, it doesn't get a chance to, to come to fruition. But you can't postpone it forever. No, no. The only thing that uh, actually eradicates old karma uh, is attaining to one of the stages of awakening. Like, like Angulimala. Yes, like Angulimala became an arahant and then all this very Super evil perfect. karma was wiped clean. And for those who don't know the story, Angulo Mali was a, we would call him in modern parlance, we call him a serial killer. He murdered uh, 99, uh, or 999 people, and he was trying to murder a thousand. And the Buddha stopped him before he, that, uh, he made his total and uh, converted him to. Um, to practicing the Dharma, and he became he became a monk, and he became an arhat. And then he was um, at, at one point he was walking in the village, and some village boys, knowing I guess knowing he his past, who abused him and threw uh, threw clods of earth at him. And they broke his alms bowl that they were made of clay in those days. Broke his alms bowl, and also uh, uh, one hit him in the head and cut him, and he was bleeding. Came back to the monastery and told the Buddha what had happened, and the Buddha said, "Bear it, Angulimala, bear it. That is the result of your past karma. If you had not become an arahant, you would have spent 999 lifetimes in hell." So that does sound like reducing. 
Yeah, but that's the, that's the only way of reducing it is be by attaining to uh, attaining to the unconditioned, becoming either a, a, if you become a stream enter is the lowest stage, then uh, you'll never be reborn lower than human. So any very evil karmas you've done are mitigated. You might still have negative results, but they won't lead you to a, an animal or a lower rebirth. And an arhan has uh, attenuated all his karma, and he's never is never reborn into samsara again. Could dying of an illness then be considered bad karma, or not someone who gets cancer when they're young? Yeah, yeah. Well, that'd be one factor. I, just like I said, everything arises from multiple causes. So, um, if someone gets a, an illness, yeah, karma is one of the causes. But then there's external biological causes. You know, you got cancer from exposure to chemicals or something. Okay, like. so one doesn't, in, in, if they're not mutually exclusive. Yes. Yeah, yeah, they work, they work together. Yeah. Sometimes I experience dread of my bad karma, having to go through it. Yeah. Even if I'm having a nice day. Yes. <laughs> um, what do I do with that dread, that fear? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not really, it's not really helpful, it's not really skillful to dwell on that. You just have to have, um, first of all, try and encourage a, an equanimity, looking, okay, I've got made this bad karma, it's in the past, I can't affect it anymore. And then looking forward, to make a firm resolution not to make any more bad karma. Are there any ideas on something like maybe a collective karma, a karma of a community or a country? Um, yeah, that's sort of ambiguous. I'm not, I'm not really decided on that. There's no, um, it's not spoken of really uh, directly or in, in most contexts. It's karmas made individually, but there is in uh, in the cosmological teachings there are the idea that this whole world is generated by the karma of the beings who expired in the destruction of the previous cycle that the, the reason there is a world at all is the co collective karma of all the beings previously so there is some sense of that but, but the emphasis is always on the individual karma that what we make as individuals It's also, I think, uh, you know, from uh, also on this issue of collective karma, I think it's, uh, you know, sometimes I, I hear people talk about like collective karma of a nation or you know, groups in that sense, and I don't think that really works because it's, it's on the individual level. So you, where you're going to be born is not going necessarily going to be into the same national group, right? So. Uh, I don't think it. I don't think it really works very well. To talk in those terms. Okay. So, people, wrap it up. Thank you all for listening. Mm-hmm. <laughs>